Okay, hello. Um, today we're going to discuss configuration. So let me start by um, introducing myself. If the um, presentation lets me. Oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, I'm Lukasz Langa. I'm a Python core developer for over two years now. Uh, you can reach me at Twitter or uh, by email, whatever. Um, the story begins in the Wild West, as most cool stories do. Um, this is the first half of the 19th century. Henry Ford wasn't born yet, and everybody was actually commuting by wagons. So horses, wagons, stuff like that. And uh, the thing that they used to actually uh, tie their wheels to the, um, to the wagons were um, knots that were actually um, tied using this tool. So this tool was produced in mass, um, mass numbers and it was actually very popular by, by then. And then something happened. People started buying wagons, people started building wagons, and there wasn't simply enough of the bolts to actually um, tie the wheels to the, to the rest of the wagon. So they started importing those from England. And there was this problem that the English uh, screws were not the same size as the tool that was used in America. And at that point, they were, they were really screwed. So somebody came with an idea to actually made, uh, make a tool that would work with more than one size of a uh, screw. And this is the tool, this is the adjustable, uh, adjustable wrench that was uh, actually invented in 1842. And this is the first example of what we can actually um, say that it was a configurable tool. So you could actually change the size of the wrench. And here we see that um, we know mm, mm, we can do that by measuring the millimeters which are uh, written on the tool itself. So that brings us to the concept of making tools configurable so that the users can decide how they should really work. Um, this tool started being so popular that most people now think that this design is really obvious. But as one of my personal heroes, Robert M. Persick says, the solutions are all simple after you have arrived at them. So um, this adjustable range is one of those. Uh, let me start by describing the four desirable characteristics of configurations that I consider the most important features of um, configurable software. The first one is maybe somewhat uh, unusual, but the most important thing for a configurable piece of software is that the configuration is composable. What that means is that it can be gathered from, uh, from several sources and it can be actually defined by different people. It's very easy to um, have a concept of how that works when you're using Linux and you use tools that have some default configuration and then let you also use the um, um, conf.d directories so you can override your own. This is very important because uh, not only you as a user um, can use this functionality but also the operating system when it gathers um, multiple packages and starts to configure their relations can use this mechanism to actually uh, keep track of how configuration should look in the first place. Configuration should be also readable because the most important thing in configuration is that the user should be able to actually see whether a toggle is on or off. 
And um, there are multiple um, examples of um, configuration systems that are not so easy, and um, especially new users cannot really distinguish what's going on. Exchangeable. Exchangeable means that if you have a readable configuration and if it's composable, it's all nice and dandy, but now then comes the time where you need to actually exchange the data with somebody else, uh, transfer it by network, or simply store it in, uh, on a disk and stuff like that. So uh, configuration should be exchangeable and discoverable. By that I mean that when you have a very large system that has multiple configuration uh, toggles, that there are very many features that you can configure, the most important thing for you is to let your new users to um, s discover your system by looking at the default configuration. So the best configuration is done by um, enabling users getting to know the system by looking at the configuration. So these are these four that I consider like the uh, fundamentals of uh, good configuration. Composability, readability, exchangeability, and discoverability. So let me actually now go to um, real world examples of how we can achieve or can't because a format doesn't really help you with that, uh, those four characteristics using what we really have a, um, in, in software nowadays. So the first format is ini. Uh, ini files are not really a format because it wasn't really defined. Microsoft simply came up with a um, structured file that they used for their software and it's somewhat started being adopted by other uh, implementations. So this is how a typical ini file looks like, but there are many variants. So um, it really depends on what software you're using. So the um, key value separators can be different. The uh, case sensitivity can, can be uh, to, can be on or off, so there can be many, uh, very many variants of ini files. But besides ini files, uh, a very often used format is obviously Apache. This is a custom format, so there's no specification apart from the Apache source code uh, as well. But it's structured, so you have. Um, lines of directives, some of those are semi-hierarchical and um, they defined their own schema for that, so uh, there are options that um, can be used in s several places but no, no, not in others, um, which is kind of um, unusual and surprising. For instance, um, if you define the first line somewhere in your HD access or uh, the main uh, Apache configuration, then indexes won't be really enabled. They will be disabled. Uh, they will be enabled if you use the second option. So the format is quite quirky, but it's so um, widely used that most system administrators can recognize what is going on there. Uh, nowadays, Nginx is like the more popular, the more um, hip version of Apache. Everybody's one, uh, everybody wants to use Nginx because it's lighter and faster and stuff like that. So we get to live with their own hierarchical um, configuration uh, format. This format also defines um, a six level hierarchy from HTTP through servers and um, locations uh, up down to the if-else statements and stuff. Okay. Um, but it's still kind of readable and uh, extensible in the same way as Apache. You can do includes and you can, um, but you cannot have those special HD access files you have in Apache. But 
these were really uh, kind of strange anyway. And then people started, started using JSON because not everybody is Apache and can really come up with their own format um, and make people use it, but people wanted to have a structured configuration. Whereas in any files, you cannot have that because you only have sections and options in those sections. Whereas in Apache, you have kind of a hierarchy. In Nginx, you have a real hierarchy. So people started using JSON. The first good thing about it is that it's actually defined in an RFC. It's made by Doug Crockford. But the first thing that you can actually uh, notice in configuration files done in JSON is that they don't have comments. <laughs> they don't have comments because J the JSON format doesn't support comments. Uh, the specification says that the JSON writers cannot and must not output comments, but the readers may or may not accept them. So uh, some JSON readers may actually ignore comments so you could use them in a configuration file, but not simple JSON in Python and not the import JSON built in uh, JSON library from Python 2.6 and later on. So that basically changes the uh, usability of such uh, configuration files by far, because you cannot really um, make the configuration file friendly for users which, who don't really know uh, what they're looking for, because it's not searchable now without any comments. This actual JSON file is from Zend, because uh, there is kind of uh, a growing number of um, projects which use JSON as their <laughs> configuration anyway. So that's that. But then we uh, start to seeing more complex formats. This is the most popular in the world, XML. It's obviously also defined in a specification, but one specification wouldn't be enough. So XML really consists of many other specifications you usually use when you use XML at itself. But the best thing about it is that actually it forces you to define a schema. That means that your configuration can be validated on input. So if a user uses a wrong value, a wrong type of value, or puts the value in the wrong place, or defines the value twice and he shouldn't, then the XML parser will shout at them and say that, ah, you basically shouldn't do that, don't do that, because the schema says that you should put that value elsewhere. So this is actually a good thing. And I pers personally believe that um, there should be schema enforcement in configuration files. So that's that. The problem with XML is that it's pretty ugly, and people say that it's human readable, but it's human readable up to a point. And actually managing large uh, XML configurations is tricky, because uh, for programmers handling pairs of tags, it's not the hardest thing in the world, but for real world users who are not um, computer scientists, even a task like this can be tricky. And um, if your configuration gets really nest deeply nested, then uh, you can get trouble with users not being able to say which tag is really not there. Um, this one, uh, the file uh, that's on the slide, is from uh, is a ZCML from Zope. Um, the um, thing about it is that they actually enforce you to use the formatting that they uh, presented here. I mean, they will accept any XML, but in the documentation they shout at you that you should really use this form of XML because this is the most readable for real human beings. Because they kind of, uh, in my opinion, overuse attributes for everything. So XML is really a complex beast, but it's widely used, mostly by Java really, because in case of Java, there's this hard distinction between what you can code and what you can configure later on. So they use XML for the things that they, want, they don't want to code right away. YAML is like the newer brother of XML, but not really. 
Actually, um, the YAML specification says itself that it is a superset of JSON, just with another notation, but s s strictly says, uh, said, it's a superset of JSON and doesn't have much to do with XML. So YAML was basically thought of as a data uh, transfer format, so not as much as for defining documents. Uh, at least at the very beginning, both use cases were uh, treated equally, but nowadays the YAML authors um, enforce you to actually think of YAML as a data storage format, as a data serialization format, so it's for data. Um, this example configuration file comes from Google App Engine, which uses YAML for configuration, uh, as well as the, a growing number of other projects. But one thing that you can actually see clearly on this configuration is that it may look like it's easy to be edited by users, but I think that it's not the case because it has significant white space as Python and um, for programmers maintaining um, white space uh, is, is, is not the largest problem in the world, but for real world users, they won't really recognize when they input tabulators or spaces or a wrong number of spaces. And um, if you start seeing people copying and pasting uh, chunks of configuration from the web, then you see that it really depends on the indentation level whether their example will work. And you know personally how copying and pasting from the web w works and what it does to white space. So, Mm, YAML, because of this um, feature that makes it really nice to uh, work with by programmers, in my opinion makes it unusable for real world users. This is another way of configuring uh, software, Turing complete formats like programming languages. We of course like Python, so this is a uh, uh, Django settings file and everybody's kind of happy with that because you can input any code you like in a settings file. It's very easy to overcome uh, a clear problem with the settings file that it mixes very many uh, layers of settings within but I think that Turing completeness is actually a problem of this approach of configuration because it lets you overuse configuration and lets you put code in there that shouldn't really be considered uh, things that configure the system. Uh, it confuses new users because if you don't understand the programming language that the um, configuration format is using, then you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, this example of the file uh, also contains a very uh, often uh, used uh, approach of specifying the um, path up to the settings PI file, which also is kind of confusing for new people because um, one thing is that if you use uh, string joining as I did in this example, then new users will be totally confused. They won't know why that works. If they really um, forget to do a double uh, braces, then they will uh, get an error. Uh, moreover, if you uh, forget to have the slash at the end of the, uh, at the end of a directory which you concatenate with another f um, part of the path, you're gonna have really strange results. And all this makes me really hesitant of um, making Python the configuration format I want to use for my projects. The other thing is that people really uh, drop the um, semicolons in uh, places that they should be in. They uh, drop commas, they forget, it, uh, they forget them. And so this format is simply too complex for simple guys to use. But then there's this another uh, group of uh, configuration formats that's even worse. 
domain specific languages, this is Cucumber in, in the example, are made up languages that are specific to a domain, so in theory, they're just cool enough for you to be able to express yourself clearly uh, in ways that you understand and the program understands as well. The problem with domain specific languages is simply that they um, express a domain in a moment of time. And in real world systems, domains shift during, uh, during the lifetime of the project. And it which, in, in which moment you're stuck with existing configuration that you have to support. And moreover, you force people to actually get to know the language you're using. But there's also another even worse kind of domain specific languages, which are subsets or strange variants of the languages that they are implemented in. So these are known as inner domain specific languages um, as opposed to external uh, DSLs. In the example you have, um, uh, you have a Puppet manifest. Puppet is a configuration tool written in Ruby, so basically their configuration is a bastardized version of Ruby, uh, which is another, uh, w w which uh, really makes you uh, long for stuff like variables and um, control structures, if else's loops and stuff like that, which this DSL doesn't give you, but it gives you inheritance and other things that Ruby does as well. So it confuses people as well. Um, Postfix did that for like 10 years now, but a growing number of projects currently start using SQL, uh, SQLite files as configuration. At first, that might seem a very bad idea, but then again, if you start thinking, SQLite is implemented in a way that those binary files are compatible across platforms. So it doesn't really matter if uh, this SQLite file uh, was started on a PowerPC machine and it's run on an Intel one. It's gonna be the same binary file. Uh, Postfix basically uses these um, files for specifying configuration of aliases, users, and stuff like that. So basically, uh, mo mo more sophisticated hash map that makes you, uh, that enables you to uh, define those and change those um, databases by external tools. So in that way, Postfix can uh, really speak to other tools without knowing the language that they're written in. Just it exposes a SQLite file, and then um, the other system can edit it. But this is simply the um, one variant of a SQLite file. The other one, which is quite more complex, is what Mongrel2 does. Mongrel2 is an application server, basically an HTTP server with uh, much more features written by Zed Shaw. And this server really uses SQLite for the whole configuration it has. So we have the SQLite command line here that lists tables from the configuration file. This is the configuration file. There is no other configuration file. There are quite a lot of tables there. You can select stuff from, from there and um, put them back and really make everything you want. But obviously, editing the SQL and making people edit those files by accessing SQLite or another access library would be re really cruel. So what Zed did was to uh, create a command line, M2SH, that basically does everything that you would want to do in a configuration file for you. It can list what the configuration file contains and it can alter what it contains. So basically, you no longer use a text editor to edit your configuration, but you use a, a tool, which has its own set of drawbacks. Uh, for instance, you cannot simply make a dip from what changed in configuration, and versioning it is quite more complex. Uh, then we have Windows Registry. 
it's hard to believe now, but at one point in Windows 95 time, Microsoft really started pushing Windows registry as a better replacement for any files. And um, they said that it's hierarchical, it has ACLs, so you can uh, manage who can access which keys, it has um, data types and stuff like that. But we already know how that ended and the number of registry, cl registry cleaners available is overwhelming. The problem with a centralized system like the Windows registry is that it's a single point of failure. When the registry database gets corrupt, corrupted, you really uh, lose all information. It also is not very exchangeable, which means it gets really tricky for you to um, export parts of uh, the registry that um, are settings of a single application. Because what you have to uh, consider is that uh, very often, settings from a single application, uh, single application aren't kept in a single um, node in the tree. They are in different places. So exporting that and importing on another machine is quite tricky. But the worst thing you can do is to think that all of those formats he's shown are not good enough. I can do better. And um, this is one of the things that every programmer will do at one point, like writing your own CMS or a game. Everybody does that, everybody fails. So do not do that because I just want to use your software. It solves my problem. And I don't want to have another problem of learning a new configuration format, a new configuration tool. I, I simply want to solve a problem I already have, not make a, myself another one. So don't impose learning curves on your users. At least really, really try hard not to do that. Because when you do, your design decisions you make may not be so intuitive for other users as they were, they were for you. For instance, the problem may be that you simply design an any format, but it is hierarchical. So if you indent stuff, it gets uh, treated as child of, a, uh, of another section. So it's very simple. But maybe for some of your users, it won't be as simple as it is for you. So design decisions, uh, if they are not clear enough, will confuse your users who are used to other Ex existing systems. But the even worse thing that if you do any programming error in writing your parser for the new configuration format, then people will actually start depending on the error you made. They will do workarounds, unless it's totally, uh, totally broken, they will do workarounds, and then at that point, if they depend on your parser quirks, they have this configuration deployed, they use it. And at that point, you have to support it forever. That means if you won't get the thing right in the first place, you won't get this, a second chance to fix it, unless you do this whole backwards incompatibility dance when nobody's happy, you aren't and your users aren't, and the number of issues on GitHub or whatever you're using rises steadily because people stumble on the things that you made uh, better, but it's not really better because it broke their configuration. So don't write your own configuration format unless you really, really have to, but for most of your um, projects, you won't have to. So how many things should be really configurable in a system? And many, maybe, there shouldn't, there shouldn't be none. It should just work and um, it should be just like fit for the purpose. So this is one of the philosophical things that get discussed over and over. There's, there's no clear answer. But let me just give you an example of what I think is the best thing you can actually do. If you're using Dropbox 
on Windows or on Mac OS or on a Linux desktop, you simply download the application and do the, uh, the setup just as you would do with every other application like Skype or whatever. But if you do install Dropbox on a command line Linux, which probably means is somewhere far from you and you just simply SSH to the machine, they say simply get the file, untar it, and run the daemon. And you're like, what? But I'm, I'm a user. I have my user account. What now? How, how do they actually download my data to the new Dropbox instance? And the way that they do that after you w get this instance and stuff is that they simply say on the, um, on the console, please visit a link and we will set it up for you. We will actually connect this new instance you just run with your account. So this is configuration, but without a configuration file, without a configuration format you, you need to learn when you're a user. Everybody knows how to use a link, so this, this is a really nice way of configuring software for your users by not exposing them for, uh, to files and, and toggles and yes, true, enable, on, stuff like that. I did that. My grandma would know how to do that if, they, if she knew how to SSH to a machine, I guess. So all of those really describe why configuration should, uh, how configuration should, like, uh, should look like. But why? Why are those so important? And it is because configuration is tricky and configuration makes things harder for your users and for you as well because if your, uh, your system is highly configurable, then it's much more complex to test. Just the other day, Django 1.4.2 was released because there was this problem with, um, with the host uh, header that could be spoofed to make your links appear in another way. So they released a secu security release and then my unit tests started failing. And after fighting this for several hours, it, um, I discovered that they fail because uh, the new unit tests for the fixed security functionality they did assume that uh, your settings won't be set up in a way that sends emails when there's a f error 500. And my settings were set up to send me when there's an error on my project. So then you can easily see if the Django guys can make it wrong, you will as well. So configuration is a burden. It is a burden that is mostly uh, required for you to actually make your system uh, usable for other users, but it should be limited. Because we are using Python, so it means that Apart from making things work, we also, um, we also are really uh, turned to systems that are beautiful, that it matters to us that the mm, solution makes sense, makes internal sense. So these are just a couple of excerpts from the Zen of Python that simple is better than complex. So if there's nothing to configure, it's simpler than if there is something to configure. And flat is better than nested, yeah, readability counts, but there should be one, and preferably only one obvious way to do it. So if there's configuration, there's already several ways to do it. So that means that you not really want a system like this, because it is not a tool for a user to use, it's a framework which you have to uh, finish a school to use. And um, if your site gets wrong or uh, anything else, you cannot be uh, a pilot anymore. You cannot really use the tool. So you really want something like this that just makes everything OK. Um, yeah, it's, it's real. Uh, you, you can visit this site. It's, it's, it's really awesome. But still, um, 
this makes me much more comfortable than, than this. It really does. So configuration is not data. And what, what do I mean by that? When you saw the first SQLite example, uh, you saw that Postfix uses uh, SQLite files for uh, specifying a hash map of aliases. And if you come to think to it, it's not really configuration uh, at all. It's data. There can be a varying number of aliases at any point in time. It's not really configuration. So configuration describes behavior and data is subject to behavior because if you're um, holding, I don't know, a list of users in your database, they are getting acted upon. So don't hold this information in your configuration. And this gets confused really often. So that means if you need a database, simply use one, but don't mix it up with simple configuration of your system. Because if you have a system that uh, has configuration that is uh, complex enough, then you, will, um, then you will have to use a Turing complete implementation of a uh, configuration format. And at that point, you'll reach this paradox where everybody knows that hard coding is a simple anti-pattern, that you push your configuration in your code, that's bad. Everybody knows that. But very many people don't recognize that the reverse thing is, is as bad. That means that if you put, put your source code into your configuration, it's just about the same thing, but the other way around. So it's also an anti-pattern. So configuration is also not code, because configuration characterizes behavior, and code executes this behavior. So gathering all of those, configuration characterizes your behavior. If your option is on, it will behave in another way in it, uh, when it is off. But it's all configuration should do, because the code really defines and executes what happens if an option is enabled or not, and it works on a set of data. So that brings us to practical stuff I wanted to talk about, and that's, I guess, the most popular uh, framework, so most of you probably worked with it or works with it currently. The problem with Django settings is that it mixes different kinds of settings not all of them you would want to have in a single file that you keep on GitHub for everybody to see. Because some of those are specific to your deployment, so configuration of your database is highly specific to you, but there are information that are also security uh, sensitive. So I mean passwords, the secure key and stuff like that. So you should really strive to split your settings PI file. Most of people do that and um, even if with their first project they do, but there are a couple of approaches uh, you can use for that. The simplest thing that most people use is simply uh, import a local variant of settings that has all of the stuff changed that is sensitive for you or deployment specific. But you can also use a package for that, so it no longer has to be a long list of files that um, are mixed up in your uh, directory. You can use every other uh, importing uh, path you would want to have. So you can uh, even uh, take your settings out of, the, out of your project uh, at all. So this is another way. But you can also do this the other way around, so that settings PI is never used directly but you define a base uh, module, which then is imported at the beginning of every specific settings file. This makes you really, um, this forces you to use the Django settings module setting, but in my opinion, it's better because it's explicit, so it's on par with the Zen of Python, that you always have to say which environment you want to run. And some of those settings can be excluded from Git, so it's quite secure. 
Another, uh, another cool way uh, to do setting splitting is actually using exec file as well, because uh, at that point you can use the uh, already defined settings in the files uh, you're executing. So basically uh, overriding settings is much easier. But this uh, particular example also uh, does something uh, quite uh, quite interesting. I mean, it um, opens uh, every conf file in a directory and sorts them by name and executes them uh, in order. So that means that you basically uh, have support for what Unix does for their tools. Uh, you can have many files and then just simply uh, use one of those that is Im imported the first as the base one, and then the other just uh, define uh, environments. Django configurations is another interesting approach to do that. Uh, this is uh, by uh, Jesdes, uh, who is one of the core developers of Django. And this approach is really nice because it's class-based, so you can use uh, all those uh, patterns you would use with classes. So uh, apart from a very clear and explicit uh, split between the a base settings file and the environmental settings, you can also do mix-ins. So for instance, the full paste caching you can add to a particular environment. So it's really nice. And um, I encourage you to check it out. It's on, it's on PyPI, so simply pip install Django configurations. Uh, then you simply export another uh, environmental um, variable to specify which environment you're interested in or specify it while running uh, the uh, manage py, PY commands. But you can also do the traditional ancient ini files uh, by specifying configuration in a format that was really made for configuration. So there's no code, there's no variables, loops, and whatsoever. But then there's this very interesting feature of the Python's config parser that you can do other ini files that uh, only contain the sensitive data you want to change. And then if you change only this, this part uh, in your uh, concrete initialization file, you can read a list of those using config parser. So you can also do a hierarchy like uh, other Unix tools do. So uh, what your source code defines as defaults and etc project configuration ini. You can support the .d stuff as well because you can use the, mm, star glo uh, from glob uh, with the config parser as I shown in the uh, previous examples up to an environmental variable. So it also uh, only depends on what you really put in your settings PI file. Um, so that would be it. Um, I personally kind of uh, like the ordered incremental exec file m the most. It's very ugly in the settings PY file, but you have to consider that it stops being a, re a real settings file for your users. It's only another source code file that they don't really access. But each and every one of those is a real solution. You can use that uh, as well. Mixing file-based configuration with command line overrides. I don't have much time left, so let me just say that uh, use config glue, which uh, at one point defines a schema for configuration, and then uh, it lets you use any files and uh, command line arguments from the from a single schema uh, definition. It's really nice, and uh, the guys that do that uh, work for Ubuntu, it also works for Canonical. Um, it's really, it's used internally in, in Ubuntu, so it's kind of uh, well, well fleshed out. There's a new project called ConfArcParse, not really there at the moment, but I hope it will, because it, it has something, it has some interesting ideas. Basically, it's, uh, replacement for arc parse that also lets you uh, import some defaults from any files. So it's totally a different approach, but it works as well. 
but whatever you do, please don't do the mistake that most of the projects do, but, uh, which is naming their command line variables totally different than the uh, names of options in the configuration file. Please do use the same names in configuration files and in command line arguments. It confuses the hell out of people. Uh, let me just end with some uh, stuff I did, because obviously you know about the Unicode stuff and about the other changes in Python 3, but the real reason you'd want to use it is basically a new version of an any parser, right? So there's config parser. Um, a traditional uh, sectioned file would look like this. So we have a default section and a specific section uh, that holds data of a user. If you would want to access it using uh, the old parser, you would have to open the string IO and do a strange dance to actually read the configuration, uh, at which point I want to ask you if you're using safe config parser when you use config parser because you really wanted to use it because each and every other config, config parser class that it's in this module is not safe and it will confuse your users if they put a um, configuration setting that really starts um, the parser trying to uh, do interpolation and stuff. So if you're using config parser, use safe config parser. But it's the old way. The new way is kind of better because there's only one config parser now, and it's the right one. So you don't have to choose. It's chosen for you already, and you simply read a string. So that's easier. But once you read a string, then you have this ancient API that really reminds me of the times of Python 1.6 and stuff. So the string module and has key methods, we don't do stuff like that anymore. But it seems that the library uh, was stuck in the way that they did that at those times. So basically the new version of config parser has a new uh, mapping, mm, map, mapping support. So it not only supports dictionaries as input and output and stuff like that, but it really is a dictionary now. So uh, you can have a much nicer API than you, uh, than you have had before with those getters and stuff like that and setters. You simply use, use it as if it would be a dictionary. Um, if you would actually like to uh, list all of the options you had, then there, there was another uh, peculiar API for that. Now you simply iterate through a section. It works, it, it returns what you would ex expect it to return. The old way of uh, che checking whether an option is there was also quite uh, ugly. The new one is better. This example also uh, shows you that you can actually uh, take a section and uh, give it a name, so uh, make a new variable out of it. And it's also really writable, so you can write to this section and then the configuration parser will be updated as well. So uh, you also have a fallback, um, have a fallback um, argument now for the getters. Uh, we, ha we had to do that because the API that was already there was incompatible with the, the dictionary one. So this is like the only time when you're going to get something else that you would get from a typical dictionary. Okay, but that's from a string. You can also define configuration from a dictionary now because, as I already said, it's a full mapping. Okay. Uh, ta -da -da -da. So you can create uh, a single section from a dictionary. The output is as, as you would expect. Uh, and we have a new interpolation format. You can write your own as well, but we uh, do have basic and extended interpolation. This one is uh, inspired by build out, so it can actually uh, traverse multiple sections. So it's transitive. 
and it's all highly customizable. This is uh, from the official documentation. You can change comment prefixes, you can change how the thing behaves. So you don't no longer have to write your own parser for that. You can simply customize the existing one. Okay, okay. But if you're stuck on Python 2.6 even, you can simply install config parser now because I maintain the backport of the things I did for 3.2. So you can use it from today now. Yes, and do you plan to add to the config parser uh, some function to have default when you get Boolean or you get integer? Because currently we fail on the... Uh, yeah, so this was a design decision uh, by, by me and the rest of the um, core development team that the config parser in its entirety is made in a way that doesn't support any file types. Uh, any any uh, any types. It simply accepts strings and returns strings for everything. If you want to actually have something that uh, accepts boolean values or numbers, you have to write your write your own. Uh, basically, the way I did the um, interpolation. La, 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 there's something. Uh, that there's the interpolation code there somewhere. Uh, makes. Uh, implementing a schema for the config parser quite easy. So you can simply uh, implement your own interpolation format that would do that for you.